Have you ever been stabbed in the back, betrayed by a friend, falsely accused? I knew a widow once who had some money and a very tender heart. She went out of her way to help young people, particularly a struggling married couple. She spent time and money on them, even co-signing for them to buy a car. Their appreciation? They left her with the note on the car, but they kept the car. I remember an older man who went an extra mile to help one of his younger brothers get started and established. Again, there was an investment in time, energy, and money. His reward was the younger brother telling his family half-truths and whole lies. After all the older brother had done, you would think that any problem the younger brother would have had would at least been given the older brother the benefit of the doubt. Instead, he gave him the benefit of nothing. You ever been stabbed in the back? Wow, just about everybody. When that happens, what should you do? How should you handle really being shafted? One of the most painful and graphic cases of backstabbing in the Bible is something I think can teach us a very valuable lesson. For three years, Jesus lived with the disciples. He took them with him. He taught them. He told them great spiritual truths and in appreciation in his hour of greatest need, they betrayed him and forsook him. For three years, Jesus lived in Palestine. He taught the people about God and righteousness. He warned them about hypocrites. He helped them. He healed them. His reward? They crucified him. He had a knife in his back and a nail in his palm, as well as his feet. And what did he do? I want us to visit Jesus as he hangs on the cross. He speaks seven times. The first time he said anything, it was this. Unimaginable. Turn with me to Luke chapter 23. And let me share with you how Jesus handled being stabbed in the back by people he had done nothing to help. Here's what he did. In Matthew chapter 23, we're told in verse 33, And when they came to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, and criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots, meaning to see who would get what. Unimaginable. They just crucified him. And you know what he did? He prayed. Imagine. He did not remain silent. He could have said nothing. He could have gotten bitter, resentful, angry. I think that's the most natural human response when you've been stabbed in the back. Paul warns us about that in Ephesians chapter 4, where he says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. Why does he have to warn us about that? And the answer is, because it is so common. But Jesus did not do that. He did not remain silent. He did not get bitter or resentful or angry. He remained in his suffering, but he prayed. He didn't remain silent and simmer. He prayed. He prayed. He not only did not remain silent, he did not speak against them. He could have cursed them. 
He could have swore at them. Again, that's another very common response. As a matter of fact, historians tell us that victims of crucifixion often do just that. They curse at the people who crucified them. Jesus did not do that. Think of all the people he could have cursed legitimately. How about Judas? How about Caiaphas, who knew that he was called the Son of God, the Messiah? How about Annas, the other high priest? Or Pilate, who felt that he was innocent and that he was king of the Jews? Or the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people who cried, crucify him, crucify him? He could have cursed them all, from Judas to the people who wanted him crucified. But he did not do that. He did not remain silent, and he didn't curse them. He didn't speak against them. Never visited anybody in jail? <clears throat> Many years ago, I actually had a jail ministry. I used to preach in jails. You know that, did you? I've talked to a lot of prisoners. And all the years I did that, matter of fact, I once had a ministry in, the, in a state prison where every Sunday I conducted a chapel service. I don't know how many prisoners I've talked to. Never met a guilty one. Correct. <laughs> met a lot of angry ones. Never met a guilty one. Well, Jesus could have done that, but he didn't. He did not seek revenge. Ooh, is that not a common way to respond to somebody who stabs you in the back? You want justice. You want revenge. In that passage I quoted a moment ago, in Ephesians chapter 4, where Paul said, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Malice is get even, revenge. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't seek wrath or revenge. He could have summoned the legion of angels to wipe them all out. He didn't do that. He prayed. He prayed. The first thing he did is he prayed. Think about that. The first words out of his mouth in the midst of agony and torture were, Father, forgive them. During his life, he preached, pray for them that persecute you. In his death, he practiced what he preached in his life. Someone has said, we do not pray on crosses. We pray in gardens. We pray in church buildings. We pray when we can get away from the noise and the confusion of the world and think clear thoughts. But we don't pray on crosses. We curse on crosses. We scream on crosses. We cry on crosses. We experience pain on crosses. You certainly don't pray on a cross. But Jesus did. He prayed. He prayed. As one preacher said, speaking on this passage, no longer can his hands minister to the sick, for they are nailed to a tree. No longer can his feet carry him on errands of mercy, for they are fastened to the wood. No longer can he instruct his disciples, for they have forsaken and fled. But one thing he can do and does do, he prays. When life knocks us on our knees, we're in the perfect position to pray. The next time somebody, notice I said the next time. The next time somebody stabs you in the back, if you want to be like Jesus, the first thing you should do is pray. All right. <clears throat> It's easy to say pray. Pray for what? 
What do you pray for? That's even more astonishing. The text says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. What you should pray for is forgiveness. That again is just remarkable. He did not pray for relief. No one would have censored him had he done that. If he had prayed to be relieved from his suffering, nobody would have charged him or complained. Did you see the film, The Passion of the Christ? That is the most excruciatingly portrayal of crucifixion I have ever seen. It was hard to watch it. Imagine going through that kind of physical suffering. And praying for those who are doing it to you. And asking God to forgive them. That is simply incredible. Nobody would have blamed him if he'd asked for relief. But he didn't. He didn't pray for retaliation. No one would have condemned him if he'd have done that. As a matter of fact, the psalmist did it. It's one of the surprises in reading the Psalms. Every once in a while you bump into one where the psalmist says, in essence, Lord, wipe them out. (laughs) Now he's doing that because they're God's enemies, not just his. But I don't think in this case, because it was done unjustly, that we would have condemned Jesus had he asked for retaliation. But he didn't. He prayed For forgiveness. Imagine that. He prayed for forgiveness. Wow. Why did he do that? Well, maybe. Why didn't he use the power for something else? Well, somebody has suggested he had the power to forgive sin when he was on the earth. But now he's lifted up from the earth, so to speak. He's no longer in a a position of authority, but in a place of condemnation. Secondly, seeking forgiveness has a condition. You have to ask for it. So he didn't just say forgive them. He asked the Father to forgive them. But that comes with a condition. They have to be willing to receive it. At any rate, the point is... He asked them, asked the Father to forgive them. Now I want to probe this for a minute. God does not ignore sin. God was asked to forgive sin, not ignore it. The Greek word translated forgive means to send away. That's all it means. But it was used of man taking a debt upon himself. It was forgiving a debt. Now bear with me for a minute because you're going to have to think to follow this. Okay? I think I have an illustration that will put it in perspective, but I want to explain it first. I've been reminded recently that people want to be entertained today. This is not entertainment. It takes some thought. Matter of fact, amusement means the opposite of thinking. Musing is thinking. Amusement is you don't think. This you've got to think about. This implies a letting go, sending away, not demanding a payment. Right? And even beyond that, it can only be done by taking the obligation or giving it to someone else. Jesus was asking, in essence, that their sin be sent away. And in doing that, it is implied it be placed on him. 
He is the Lamb of God that bears the sin of the world. He calls upon the Father not to hinder them, but to lay their sin on Him. In short, He prayed, Father, forgive them by condemning me. Now think about this. A holy God cannot excuse sin. He can only forgive it. In doing so, the just demand must be paid. Thus Christ himself is the justifier as he reconciles the world unto himself. Let me see if I can illustrate this. In the book of Philemon, Onesimus is a slave that runs away. He runs to Rome from Colossae. He meets Paul. Paul leads him to Christ and sends him back. And then Paul says this, If he owes you anything, put that to my account. Remember that passage? That's what's going on here. But let me illustrate it another way. And this really gets at what I'm trying to say. Let's suppose that you are a merchant. And you buy merchandise and put it on sale in your store. And I come and buy your merchandise on credit. Then I do not pay the debt. And you forgive the debt. What does that mean? Who pays? You do. You bought the merchandise. You paid for the merchandise. And by forgiving me the bill, you assume it. That's forgiveness. That's forgiveness. This is one of the most profound truths in all of the Bible. The Bible contains a concept of justice. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The Bible contains a concept of mercy, compassion, love, forgiveness. But what it does is it weds the two together. God is compassionate by being just. And the justice is the just demand is met and therefore God can forgive. Let me put it another way. In a courtroom, a judge could do one of three things. First of all, he could enforce the penalty of the law. That's strict justice. Whatever the crime, there is a penalty. Justice is the penalty is paid and you pay it. The second thing he could do is disregard the requirements of the law. What's that expression? I throw myself on the mercy of the court. So we're going to ignore the penalty and just express mercy. What's the third possibility? The only other way is for the penalty to be paid so that there can be mercy but a third party has to pay it. So the judge could say, the penalty in your case is 30 days in jail or a thousand dollar fine. And that's got to be paid. But you don't have to pay it. I will pay it. And by paying the thousand dollars or spending 30 days in jail, Justice has been satisfied so that mercy can be expressed. That's the basis of biblical forgiveness. And embedded in this statement in Luke 23, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'm suggesting to you that if you want to be like Christ, when you are stabbed in the back, The first thing you ought to do 
is pray. When somebody betrays you, when somebody just shafts you, pray for them. Pray that God forgives them. And that implies the penalty has to be paid. In the first place, if it comes to sin, Jesus paid it. And when it comes to interpersonal relationships, I take the hurt without retaliation. I tell you, this is a deeply, deeply profound biblical concept. You say, wow, there's more. I want you to look at this statement again. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Wow. Does Jesus mean that by asking God to forgive them, they, he should do it because they are ignorant? If you commit a sin in ignorance, does that warrant forgiveness? Well, in order to answer that, we have to make some observations. There are sins of ignorance. And they are less sinful before God than sins of knowledge. Matter of fact, that's something that is not often recognized, but is very biblical. <coughs> Matter of fact, the Bible specifically says that Eve was deceived and Adam deliberately sinned. So when it goes to showing blame, Adam gets charged, not Eve. There was a difference between the sin of Eve and the sin of Adam. She sinned out of ignorance. He sinned fully aware of what he was doing. Isn't that interesting? If that's not interesting enough, listen to this. Paul says, I was formerly a blasphemy or persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Wow. Is there a sin of ignorance? Yes. Are you forgiven because it was ignorant? No. What's that rule? Did you ever get stopped for speeding and say, I, 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 didn't, I didn't realize that I was speeding? Or, or I didn't realize the speed limit was... Did you ever do that? You were, you're not going to confess, right? And what does the officer say? Ignorance of the law excuses none. Ignorance is not an excuse. As a matter of fact, Sin before God, whether done ignorantly or willfully, is still sin. And in the Mosaic Law, God made provision for the atonement of sins of ignorance. There was a special sacrifice you could give if it was done in ignorance. You can find that in Leviticus 5 and Numbers chapter 15. One author says, the sins of ignorance need atonement just as truly as do conscious sins. God is holy, and he will not lower his standard of righteousness to the level of our ignorance. Ignorance is not innocence. I thought that was particularly well said. Another said, we must be aware of supposing that ignorance is not blameworthy. And that an ignorant person deserves to be forgiveness, forgiven for their sins. At this rate, ignorance would be a desirable thing. All spiritual ignorance is more or less culpable. It is part of man's sin that he does not know better than he does. So, though they were ignorant, it is not as serious as full knowledge, but they are still guilty. So as one commentator said, our Lord does not mention the ignorance 
of those who prayed as a plea for pardon, but as a description of their state. May I repeat that? It is critically important. By saying they know not what they do, he's not arguing forgive them because they don't know what they do. He's simply describing their state. In the past, that was the true of all of us. We've all committed sins as in unbelief. But ignorance never gives us a claim on God. But it does put us within the range of his mercy. What about someone who says it's not fair for God to condemn those who did it in ignorance? I mean, that's the next logical objection to what I'm saying, right? Well, they didn't know, so how can God condemn them for that? If that bothers you, then I have a suggestion. We have knowingly committed enough sins to make up for the few we committed in ignorance, so that's not going to get you out of this. Now, here's the point. Jesus prayed. He prayed for forgiveness recognizing they didn't understand their guilt. Now think, the next time somebody crucifies you, pray for their forgiveness. Even when they don't understand their guilt. Isn't that interesting? That's heavy stuff, folks. Doesn't get any heavier than that. Your enemy might not think he's guilty. They didn't. He might not fully understand his guilt. They didn't. It might have been a sin of ignorance. Apparently it was on their part. And you still need to pray for them. And forgive them. I think there's another lesson here. We rarely realize the magnitude of our actions. So that's it, folks. That's the point. If you wish to be like Jesus, when people stab you in the back, when people crucify you, pray for their forgiveness, even when they don't understand what they've done. I think this is one of the most profound, most practical, most important truths in all of the Scripture. I think the New Testament has a lot to say about this. I'm just focusing on the statement Jesus made on the cross. If you want to explore this further, you might look at 1 Peter chapter 2, where Jesus is undergoing suffering, and it says he committed himself to him that judges righteously. Or you could go to James 5, where he's talking about people being treated unjustly, and it says, be patient, fix your heart, and quit your grumbling. Don't swear. And then, of course, we've got this passage that says, pray for those that have hurt you and pray for their forgiveness. It is appropriate that God should communicate his concern for forgiveness on the cross. That's what the cross is all about, isn't it? Now you know this, but hear me well. We come to the cross to be forgiven. You know that. We've sinned. The penalty is death. Jesus died in our place to pay for our sin and arose from the dead. And so we come to the cross. We look at the cross. We look at the payment Jesus gave and we trust Him and that payment and God freely forgives us. So we come to the cross to be forgiven. But in this passage, we come to the cross to learn 
to forgive. And that's different. You can be forgiven and never having learned how to forgive. I've quoted several times today that passage in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. The next verse says, And be kind one to another, forgiving one another even as Christ has forgiven you. So come to the cross and receive forgiveness. Come to the cross and learn to forgive. I can't think of any more critical message. Having spent decades in the ministry and talked to hundreds of people one-on-one, -on -one, this is a very common problem. People need to learn to forgive. To forgive people who have wronged them and don't realize what they've done or won't acknowledge what they've done. You can not afford to harbor the anger and the bitterness and the unforgiving spirit. As somebody has said, anger is like acid. It eats the container that holds it. So if you harbor this bitterness and this anger and this unforgiving spirit, it doesn't hurt the other person, it hurts you. So come to the cross and be forgiven. Come to the cross and learn to forgive. Andrew Jackson lay dying when his pastor came to visit him. And interestingly enough, his pastor said, do you forgive all your enemies? And Andrew Jackson said, I forgive all enemies freely from my heart, but the man who lied about my poor dead wife, I will not forgive him. You know, that's about the way of all of us. And I, if I say you need to forgive people, you, you say, I do that. I, I, you know, I forgive them. I mean, are there people you've forgiven? Yeah, you know, I forgive them. It's just that one or two. You know, you hang on to that one. Well, it's that one I'm talking about today. So the pastor said to Jackson, the Savior made no exceptions. Jackson had to think about that for a minute. The minister said, all your enemies. Jackson thought he didn't respond immediately. He seemed greatly distressed. Then he looked at the pastor and said, I can do it. He said reverently, I will pray to God to forgive them. That's the way you handle being stabbed in the back. Folks, this is one of the great profound truths of Christianity. I don't know of anything like it in any philosophy, in any piece of literature, or any Religion, this is profound stuff. That people who have severely hurt you, you should forgive. So that they can be forgiven. That's the highest and the ultimate. Did not the Lord teach us to love him and love our neighbor? And that word means to do what's best for them. So no matter what this person has done to you, isn't the best thing for them to be forgiven? Amen. And isn't that ultimately what love is about? Of course. We need to forgive. So that they can be forgiven. I'm going to tell you a story. 
that I think really puts this in perspective. Many years ago, there was a man named Jacob de Silza, who was on PK duty in California when he first heard of the attack on Pearl Harbor. He was furious at what had happened, at what the Japanese had done. So he resolved to retaliate personally. In April of 1942, he got his chance. As a B-25 bombardier, when Doolittle's raid attacked Tokyo, he was there and he got his revenge. During that fateful run, the plane ran out of fuel. The crew bailed out over enemy territory. Jacob was captured and spent the next 40 months as a POW. including 34 months in solitary confinement. Three of his buddies were executed, and another died of slow starvation. He had lots of time to think. What makes people hate each other, he wondered. Doesn't the Bible say something about love your enemies? So he asked for a Bible. Eventually, he got one. And he began to read with fascination. He read many parts, six or seven times or more. Then ten days into his study, he asked Jesus Christ to forgive him. He later wrote, Suddenly, when I looked at the enemy officer and the guard, I realized if Christ is not in a heart, it is natural to be cruel. My bitter hatred changed to loving pity. Remembering Christ's words on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He asked God to forgive his tormentors. Fourteen months later, in April of 1945, paratroopers liberated Jacob from his prison cell. After the war, a chaplain on General MacArthur's staff Wanting, wanted something to help heal the animosity between the U.S. and the Japanese. He approached a guy named Don of the Bible Literature, uh, Literature International who had read Jacob's story. And so what they did is they put it in a booklet and circulated the booklet entitled, I Was a Prisoner of Japan. A Japanese naval pilot, Misu Fuchude, was chief commander of the historical December 7th raid on Pearl Harbor. He was advised against, he advised against raiding the American base, but when the orders were given, he led the assault. Eventually, he logged more than 10,000 combat hours. But his closest brush with death came when he was on the ground in Japan. He was in Hiroshima the day before the atom bomb was dropped. His life was spared when headquarters summoned him to Tokyo. When the war ended, he returned to his family. Later, stepping off a train in Tokyo, he was given a copy of that little pamphlet. That stimulated him to read the Bible. Despite his Shinto heritage, he trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now folks, that's as awesome an illustration as I could find short of the cross itself. An American airman is taken prisoner, is converted prays for his captives, writes his testimony, and some of them got saved as a result. If you want to be like Jesus, when you are stabbed in the back, when you are crucified, pray. Pray that they be forgiven, even if they don't realize their guilt. You say, wow. 
I'm not sure I can do that. I am sure you can't, nor can I. That's why it takes the grace of God. But you see, that's what the Spirit of God is about. And when you say, Lord, give me the grace to forgive, you will be the victor and not the victim. 